Good evening and welcome to the Journey Home program. I'm your host tonight, John and Mark Grodi, and we are back again with another story, another story of what the Lord has done in our lives. Each one of us is in a story. We don't always recognize that. Sometimes when we hear another person telling of their conversion, how the Lord touched them and brought them home, we realize there are ways in which I haven't even recognized this in my own life. And so I hope uh, tonight's guest is an inspiration to you, helps you to see your own story. We're joined by Dr. Annie Bullock, uh, former Baptist and Episcopalian. Uh, Annie, oh, yeah. thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. We just had a friend of yours on recently, right? Yes, Emily Woodham. Yeah. Yeah, she's a dear friend from Austin. It's a good conversation. You both yeah. feature in each other's stories, I think, a little yeah, bit. So yeah. we'll hear about her today. Well, it's great to have you here tonight. Um, thank you. Uh, step way back. Um, we were talking beforehand. Your journey begins, or maybe doesn't begin, but in your, your grandfather. Absolutely. was a preacher. Yeah, yeah, so I grew up in Spokane, Washington, mm -hmm. and my first experience of church that I think shaped me and formed me in so many ways was in my grandfather's church, which was a little tiny Baptist church down on Gravel Road. It was made of cinder blocks, and he had another full-time job, but he did this kind of uh, on the side, and he, it was a congregation of maybe 30 or 40 people mm -hmm. all told, and I learned there, I think, uh, reverence. Yeah. We weren't allowed to run around. We weren't allowed to talk when we got in the sanctuary. It was very uh, reverent, peaceful experience. But it was also the kind of community where like, people stood outside and had a cigarette before the service. Mm -hmm. It was very working class and mm -hmm. very kind of grounded. And um, I feel like that was always what I was trying to get back to because yeah. that was so formative for me. The other thing I, I think I learned from my grandfather was uh, the value of study. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a man with an eighth grade education. He would want me to tell you who went to one semester of ninth grade. Um, but he didn't finish high school. His family circumstances were such that he just needed to work. And so he went and worked in the mines. But when it came to the Bible, he studied. He studied almost obsessively. He felt like, if I'm going to preach this, I yeah. need to know what it says. And it needs to not just be about my feelings and how it applies yeah. to me. It needs to be about the, the core of what the message is. So he had shelves and shelves and shelves of commentaries, and he would just pour over that text. And those are the things I think, uh, it wasn't a long period of time. My grandfather was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. in his 50s and he had to retire fairly early and I wasn't in that church a long time, but those are the things that I sort of took forward with me. That's really powerful. Um, yeah. They also taught me that the Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon <laughs> <laughs> from the book of Revelation uh, and that Catholics yeah. were to be avoided mm -hmm. at all costs. Um, there was actually a community of sisters that lived on this my grandparents owned a store and there was sort of railroad tracks and up on this bluff there was this big building that I thought it was a castle yeah. and I used to say I want to go up on the castle I want to go see that someday and my grandmother in all seriousness told me that I should never go up there because the nuns would kidnap me mm -hmm. so it was like the boogeyman a little bit so yeah. I had just nothing to do with it mm -hmm. after my grandfather retired we went to another Baptist church and by the time I was a teenager my my parents wanted a youth group for us, mm -hmm. my sister and I. So they decided to go to this church. I think it was Presbyterian. And I say I think because we showed up and within a year the church split. Uh -huh. And so that happened very quickly. We just came one day and the pastor was announcing that he was leaving mm -hmm. uh, and he was just going to start his own church. It was the pastor and the youth pastor and a few others. Mm -hmm. And we went with them, yeah. which was a huge, I mean, I don't want to say traumatic, but it was very uh, kind of a devastating yeah. event. This church yeah. to kind of fall apart, and some of my friends stayed, and some of our friends left, and we went with them. And from that point until I was in college, we attended this church that met in high school auditoriums and became this huge thousand member wow. thing. And we went to this youth group that started out, you know, 7,500 kids and became 450,500 kids on a Wednesday night. And was very all-consuming. Mm -hmm. We were there every Wednesday. I was at a small group Monday night. We were there Sunday morning um, for a youth group meeting before the service. And it just sort of kind of took over my whole spiritual life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like it. I mm -hmm. didn't like any of it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like it. And there were a lot of reasons I didn't like it, I think. It just didn't ever feel like it fit me. Mm -hmm. I always felt like I was a little bit wrong for it. It was very evangelical. 
um, they would do sort of pop songs and do like a Christian version yeah. of it and that kind of thing. And I never liked that. I grew up being taught that that wasn't was there what you should do. Sort of a disconnect between what you encountered with your grandfather? Yes. Oh, okay. my, with my grandfather, I felt v things were very different. Mm -hmm. This was a place where everyone at least was very similar socioeconomic class and really, you know, it was kind of everything needs to look good, even if I'm not really a very nice person. Mm -hmm. And it, there was a lot of engagement with the culture that I had been taught. You should just stay away from the culture. Everything in the culture is bad. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, and I didn't have any language to explain that. Yeah. I just knew that I didn't quite fit in. I, everyone thought I was sort of stiff and rigid and um, critical of everything in a way that didn't win me a lot of friends, which is sort of understandable because I, I don't think I was um, easy to be around at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there I was wanting something more, wanting something deeper. That was the other piece for me is there was not a sensibility for study. There was not, we want to really dig into the Bible and understand what it means. It was, let's go to this group and talk about how we feel about this. And mm -hmm. let's talk about how this applies to my life. How do I think it applies to my life? And it, there wasn't enough um, depth t for me. Those two concepts, the reverence and the study, like there's a connection there, it yes. seems like. You know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the reverence, my reverence was largely directed toward the Bible. Yeah. And I had this sense that the Bible had the answers and we should take it seriously and right. we should study it really deeper, earnestly yeah. to go deeper. And there was <laughs> really no, the only thing we ever, even when I was little, got deep on was the end times and figuring mm. out, you know, the rapture and pre-post. And that wasn't part of my youth group experience. So mm. I started complaining about this a lot. It was sort of you know, teenage girl, angsty <laughs> complainer. And my friend said to me, you know, there's one small group in our youth group that is reading the Bible in Greek. Hmm. Maybe that's something you'd be interested in and we'll stop complaining. And I thought, okay, maybe I could, maybe that's it. Maybe <laughs> that's something that would help me. I could read it in the original language, at least the New Testament and try and understand it. And so I got my courage together to go ask the youth pastor. It took a while before I felt like I could I went up there after Wednesday night, I climbed up that stage, I had introduced myself, he had no idea who I was, and I just started telling him everything I didn't like about my small group, which was not a great opening, um, but I felt like it was shallow, I felt like I already knew everything we were talking about, I felt like it just wasn't giving me what I needed, mm -hmm. and I could tell from the look on his face that he was not receiving any of this well, he yeah. sort of was, and so I sort of rushed into my request, which was, can I please be in the group that studies Greek. I heard there's a group that studies Greek. Yeah. And he took a, a breath and kind of put his chin up and said, first of all, it's very clear to me that you are exactly where God wants you to be because you don't know as much as you think you do mm. and you're incredibly arrogant and there's some pride going on here and you need to just stay where you are until you realize that you have a lot to learn mm. from the people in your group. And secondly, there would be no point in you studying Greek. In fact, it would be inappropriate because you're a girl. Uh -huh. And studying Greek is for people who are going to be pastors. And I walked away from that conversation. I went to the back of the room where my friend was waiting for me. And I sat on the floor and I just cried. And I thought, I mean, that was the first time in my life that someone had communicated to me that my desire to study yeah. was a problem. I was the first time that there was a door that was closed to me just because I was a girl right. in my life, mm -hmm. which sounds interesting thinking I grew up in a, in a fundamentalist, you know, mm -hmm. sort of Baptist church. I never felt like any of that was off limits. I never wanted to be a pastor, but I never felt like my intellectualism or my desire to know more was a problem. It reflects a, a, a very narrow utilitarianism about study, that the only point of study is if you're like, again, you go to school to get a job. Well, exactly. No, you're educated to be formed as a person. Right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's, I think that formation is what I wanted. And because I, I sort of was taken aback, I'm yeah. not trying to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor mm -hmm. ever. And I, but I, yeah, I wanted to study, I wanted to know more. And he just thought, point A, point B, this doesn't yeah. make sense for you. Mm -hmm. At that point, I didn't want to go anymore. And mm -hmm. I stopped going to youth group. I wanted to stop going to that church. I wanted to stop going to church altogether. Mm -hmm. And that was very concerning to my parents, obviously, and they sort of made me go until we got to a point where my mom said, okay, just be honest with me. Is, do you not want to go to church or do you not want to go to this church? And I said, it's this church. So she said she would go church 
shopping with me. And so we went to every kind of church. We started with, you know, sort of American Baptist and different kinds of Baptist, and we visited all the Baptists, and then we tried some other things. I think we went to a Methodist church and a Lutheran church, and she was convinced that what I really wanted was a woman pastor. So we went to a Disciples of Christ church that had a woman pastor, and they were all fine. We went to a Greek Orthodox church. I had no idea what was going on, and I didn't really, none of them really took, they, none yeah. of them made me say, okay, this is where I want to be. Yeah. And I asked her during that time, I said, well, could we try Catholic church? And she said, no. Which, uh, that's kind Absolutely of out of nowhere. Where did that, that come from in you? Well, so where that came from, <laughs> I can explain. Okay, yeah. so I had two friends at school. Yeah. One was Lutheran and one was Jehovah's Witness. And we used to talk about theological questions all the time. And we would go to the library at Gonzaga University and we would sit in there and we would look over the books and we would try and figure things out and try and look at the Greek and, and try and convince my Jehovah's Witness friend that she was wrong and vice versa. <laughs> and we had a great time doing it. And my Lutheran friend periodically would say, let's go ask this professor. There's a professor who has an office in the library. Let's go ask this professor, father somebody. And I said, no, I am not about to go talk to a Catholic priest. Absolutely not. And he said, well, I'm gonna go. We were having an argument about um, heaven and hell because of course my Jehovah's Witness friend didn't believe in hell. Mm. Um, her belief was that you would either, if you weren't one of the 144,000 that was going to heaven, you would um, live forever in paradise on earth or you would be annihilated. Hmm. So there's no eternal punishment. Um, so we were talking about this and he's like, what about purgatory? I'm gonna go ask that priest. And so he went and asked him. Uh, I was not going down there. When he came back though, the answer was really good answer. Hmm. It started with scripture, and then it went into sin, God is holy, and our sin cannot be in the presence of God. Now, mm -hmm. that was something I believed. That was something I agreed with. That was something I felt like I would have said was a, a biblical or scriptural idea. Therefore, however you call this, there has to be a, at least a moment or a process of purgation by which our sins are burned away before we can be in God's presence. And I was like, hang on a second. I think that that makes an awful lot of sense. And I had always been taught that everything that Catholics believed that sounded different came from the apocryphal books It came, or they didn't come from the Bible at all. Right. So that was so clearly being argued from scripture to me that I was very, it gave me pause. Yeah. And I thought maybe these people have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of where that conversation sure. or that question, hey, can we go to a Catholic church came from. The other place is that after that answer about purgatory, I thought, well, maybe I could read a Catholic book. Like, it wouldn't be the worst thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I just went to the bookstore and wandered around until I found something that looked interesting. I picked up The Dark Night of the Soul by wow. St. John of the Cross. I don't know what I thought it was about at the yeah. time. I read it. I read it twice. Mm -hmm. And then in the introduction, it mentioned uh, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. So yeah. I picked that up as well. And I was fascinated with the idea that they had this desire to be close to God, to have this relationship with Jesus Christ. And then they also had like instructions, mm -hmm. a method, here's how you do it, right. that was actually more than be close to Jesus or be like Jesus. I don't know, read your Bible more. Yeah. There was more to it. And I thought, okay, maybe this has something to add. I'm not yeah. going to become Catholic. No. But, you know, they're not, maybe they're not entirely wrong. Sure. That was my sort of, my new thought. Um, and so that's where I was at the end of high school. I really kind of just gave up on the church shopping and we went back to that same church mm -hmm. and like, attended there. And I chose to go to an evangelical college, which was, I, uh, in hindsight, I don't really understand mm -hmm. that decision sure. uh, because I was sort of dissatisfied yeah. with things, but I think I thought that it would be safer mm -hmm. um, than going somewhere where I would be exposed to a lot of sure. what I would have thought of as secular ideas. And so I decided to go to this, this Christian college um, and didn't really fit there, mm -hmm. but we had to declare church attendance it was required. Mm -hmm. And declaring church attendance meant, I go to this church, you had to sign a form, and here's the ministry that I'm involved in there. Mm -hmm. And so I was attending a church I was several people's ride to this church, and I got to the point where uh, I didn't really like going, and so I decided to go to a Catholic church on a Saturday night. 
I realized that they had a Saturday night service, and I was like, I'm going to go. I'm going to show up. And had you gone to one? I'd never been in a Catholic so church. So when you had asked your mother, you guys just... You never we never been? went. Okay, okay, I wasn't sure about that. I, she okay. said no. Okay. Absolutely not. Greek okay. Orthodox was okay somehow, but huh. absolutely no, we're not going to the Catholic church. We didn't even go to an Episcopal church. I see. Okay. She just said no. So I had never been in a Catholic church before. So right. here I am in college, and I am ready to um, visit this Catholic church. I'm going to go to it Saturday night, because then I can go, and I can still drive people to church Sunday mm-hmm. morning. And there were two churches in town. One was called St. Joseph, and the other was called Our Lady of Mercy. I was not going to go to anything called Our Lady of Anything. <laughs> nope, thank you. So I went to St. Joseph's, and I remember so vividly the first time I went in there. I've mm-hmm. never been in a Catholic church before, and I thought it was so beautiful, mm-hmm. just ethereally beautiful. Now, I've been back to that church. It is not an attractive building. Mm-hmm. It's very square. It's very 1960s, mm-hmm. tan brick. But it was big and open, and it was just, it was a space that wasn't used for anything but prayer. Mm. And I could just feel that. Holy, set apart. Set apart. And the last time I'd been to a church that only used that space for prayer was my grandfather's church, because we always met in auditoriums and gymnasiums, and I was tired. So I really connected with that. And I would come in as close to the beginning as possible so that I didn't have to interact with anyone and I would leave during communion. But I went for a period of time. I went every Saturday and then I went somewhere else every Sunday. And I loved the priest. Uh, He would, nothing about the way he did the liturgy was about him. He wasn't, it wasn't his personality, it wasn't his charisma, it wasn't, um, even the the homily was just very simple and very direct. Um, And he was just very uh, elegant sort of, I thought of him as being very understated, and he wore Birkenstocks with black socks under the (laughs) alb as he went down, and I thought, I just like really find him fascinating. Now that I know more Catholic priests, I I think, you know, I I totally get it. I know what kind of of man we were dealing with, but at the time I'd never seen that, and he would pray it, and he would say, uh, grant us peace in our day, and that was the first time I'd heard a clergy person pray for the world, Mm -hmm. rather than just say, the world's going to hell and we need to escape Uh from it. And so I just thought the Mass was beautiful and the church was beautiful, and I loved it. And I went to, sounds like I'm about to become Catholic, and I'm not. It's going to take a long time. But I went to the Office of Spiritual Formation, and I said, what if I declared church attendance at a Catholic church? Mm-hmm. And in fairness to the man who answered the question, I think he thought I meant this in an abstract way. But mm-hmm. he said, in order to declare church attendance, you have to be involved in a ministry there, which means you'd have to be a member, which means you'd have to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you were Catholic, you probably wouldn't want to sign our statement of faith. Mm. So it wouldn't really work out. Yeah. And that was the end. Mm. I thought, okay, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it without seriously upsetting my family. I can't do it without transferring schools. I was already a transfer. I I can't, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so... I started attending what we used to like to call bedside Baptist, mm. where you sleep in on Sunday morning <laughs> with Pastor Pillow. Yeah, um, <laughs> I've never heard that one it's before. It's so silly. Um, <laughs> I did that for a while, and then my choir teacher heard me complaining. Mm. I want a liturgical church. I'd learned that word. A liturgical church that's not Catholic. And he said, you know, I'm Episcopalian. You could come. You could sing in the choir. Um, and I said, okay, I'll try it. And I went one time and I thought, okay, this is close enough. Yeah. Good enough. Mm-hmm. So at the same time, independently, when my husband and I, we were dating at the time, we'd never discussed it. He was attending an Episcopal church. Okay. We really had not talked about it. Um, and finally I told him, I think I'm going to go to this church. And he was like, you know, I've been going to this 8 a.m. service before my regular church service. And I really like it. I think I'm going to try going there. And so we were like, okay, this is it. We're going to be Episcopalian. We knew exactly nothing about the Episcopal Church beyond our individual congregations, Mm -hmm. which were in relatively small towns and were pretty traditional, and Mm -hmm. we just really had no idea what we were getting into, to be perfectly honest, and we decided we were Episcopalians. We got married, and then I got into Emory for my graduate degree, and we moved to Atlanta, which is a big city Mm -hmm. um, and very different, and we went to the Episcopal Church the first Sunday that was closest to our house, and we were absolutely shocked by what we saw, and mm-hmm. it was very, I had, I've gotten to know that priest since, she's a nice person, mm-hmm. it was very 
there was something very smug and kind of almost tongue in cheek about the way they did everything. Yeah. That really rubbed us both the wrong way. Aside from the fact that the priest was a woman, everyone on the altar party was a middle-aged woman, like mm -hmm. almost the congregation. It just did not feel like it fit us. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was very, we just knew it wasn't where we were gonna land. That's interesting uh, that I've had that experience. I'm not so sure necessarily, probably in some liturgies before, but yeah, that sense of uh, a desire for the tradition, desire for liturgy, desire for something palpable, yeah. and then encountering people for whom it's it's not real to them. Yeah, it There's was some, like in some way, you know, it's, like playing dress up. Yeah, like just this kind of self-conscious, self-aware sort of. Mm -hmm. um, I'm having fun with this. Yeah, that I really and that and I've encountered that in all kinds of. It wasn't about her being a woman. It was about mm -hmm. her style that really put us off. And like mm -hmm. I said, she is a nice person. It just wasn't. And we've seen that in other places and other kinds of. And then I think I started mm -hmm. to recognize that even in my church where I was going to college, he would sort of start the liturgy by saying, the Lord be with you, yeah. in this way that I thought was kind of like it was funny, mm -hmm. and I it didn't really sit right, so we didn't quite know what to do. Yeah. We went to a bunch of other denominations, we went to a lot of churches, mm -hmm. and then we were in the Yellow Pages, and we found something that said Anglo-Catholic, ah. which we knew, again, exactly nothing about that, mm -hmm. but we showed up, and here was this tiny little church in an, in an urban neighborhood that was just, it was all wood. It was a little little shabby, mm -hmm. but like in a good way, mm -hmm. stained glass and this beautiful, uh, beautiful liturgy, beautiful people, a mix of people. Someone was having a cigarette out by the door when we came in, just things that I recognized from my yeah. childhood that I thought, this is it, this is where I mm -hmm. wanna be. Um, and the pastor was Father Warren Tangi, who's been on this show, right. um, and he was great. He was just quirky you know, sort of very serious, very reverent man, mm -hmm. and we just absolutely loved him and thought, okay, this is it, we're gonna be Anglican now. Mm -hmm. And went through the confirmation process, which took a little while, and both of us were confirmed, and we thought, this is it, we're gonna raise our kids in this tradition, this is what we're doing, this is, this is who we are. It was while we were at that church mm -hmm. that we really were introduced to the larger politics of the Anglican Communion. Mm -hmm which are exhausting yeah. and confusing. And I mean, even my confirmation, I wasn't confirmed by the local bishop. I was confirmed by an Episcopal visitor mm -hmm. who came from a different diocese. It was this whole kind of business that it just, it's, it was confusing. And I mm -hmm. got really into it for a while and I sort of enjoyed it in a weird way. Mm -hmm. and it was all the minutia and it was all kind of, gave me <laughs> a channel for my intellectual energy, I guess, mm -hmm. and I, I really, invested myself in being a particular kind of Anglican mm -hmm. and really thought somehow that that was gonna, that things were gonna work out, that we were gonna get recognition, that they were gonna change the church, that the church was gonna, a new church would form, that mm -hmm. somehow it was all gonna come together. And I think at that point, my husband and I felt like the real church, the real story was somewhere between Catholic and Orthodox that that's where the truth was, that uh -huh. it didn't exist anywhere in any of the churches that we knew, that it was kind of somewhere in between. Yeah. And we thought maybe within Anglicanism we can kind of kind of find it find that, and, and create it for ourselves, mm -hmm. I guess, is how it really would have worked. It was just sort of if we can look at everything and we can judge everything and we can decide here's where it mm -hmm. should be, here's where the truth really lives, right. then that's you know where we should be. So we decided we have to stay Anglican. Mm. There's no other option for us. Um, we visited uh, an a Orthodox church on and off mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta, had a wonderful priest who was really interested in us converting yeah. um, because I think he saw we, we had an interest. We occasionally would go to Catholic churches in town. We sometimes would go to a vigil mass or I would just say, can we go this week? And we would go, but we didn't. Yeah, we thought we need to stay somewhere in between. What? That might be a good place for a break there. Okay. You know, this maybe Anglicanism as this, maybe this can be our rock point. This right, can right. be our approximation, you know, in the midst of all the messiness. Um, we'll, we'll come back in a couple minutes okay. you know, and hear, you know, what got you off that rock or, or what happened next. But uh, it, 
Thanks for joining us so far for this story. We're going to hear the rest of Annie's story here in a few minutes. Uh, I want to remind you, again, if you anything in this story touches your heart, if you're on a journey uh, uh, thinking about becoming Catholic or coming back to the Catholic Church, we'd love to walk that journey with you. So check out chnetwork.org. We've got uh, other stories like Annie's, other resources, as well as an online community of people who are at some place in this journey. And so we'd love to be praying for you and helping you along. But we'll be back in a couple minutes to hear of Dr. Annie Bullock's story. See you in a minute. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. When we left off, Dr. Annie Bullock has been telling us her story. She's a former Baptist and Episcopalian. Uh, it's been a great story so far. We were just talking during the break about that, um, you know, the, the the impact of your grandfather's reverence, you know, and how, how much that formed you. Uh, I, and I always think about that with some of these stories that what impacts us the most is the example of other people, you know, and that sense of reverence. It seems like that, that carried you through, that followed you through a lot of other experiences. Um, and when we left off, again, you, you find yourself in sort of this no man's land territory, that there's, there's definitely something there. It's not quite Catholic. It's not quite Episcopalian. Maybe Anglicanism is our safe haven for that. That's so what happened next? There. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, we really, I think, in that parish, that Anglo-Catholic parish, which mm-hmm. was in that sort of Oxford movement tradition yeah. of trying to retrieve what's Catholic in the Anglican tradition and, and, and really be Catholic, truly Catholic, not big C Catholic, we would say, but little C, Mm -hmm. you know, truly Catholic, is really where a lot of what would have been my childhood sort of doctrinal issues with the Catholic Church were worked out. Sure. It's very much easier to sort of believe that Christ is present in the Eucharist when everybody around you is genuflecting and everyone is behaving as if it's Mm -hmm. true and you're hearing from sermons, from Mm -hmm. the pulpit, from scripture, here's how it's true you know, the statue of Mary is at the back and we stop and say, Hail Mary on the way out. Just praying it really helped me sort of move through a lot of that Catholic Church is the boogeyman feeling, like, uh, is this okay? We really just got very comfortable with a lot of things through that Mm -hmm. um, theologically. I think our last bastion was really authority Mm. because the way we were approaching everything we both had been raised that it was up to us to figure it out. Mm-hmm. It's up to us to figure out who, where the truth is. I've got scripture and I've got this responsibility yeah. to make sure that I'm holding the truth the right way and that I'm in a church that's teaching the truth the right way. Mm-hmm. And so when we both had, my husband and I had grown up with that sense of you listen to the sermon and you see, does it fit with my interpretation of scripture? Is that mm-hmm. preacher on the right path? That kind of thing. And right. so as we looked around, like I said, we felt like, well, the truth seems to be in this no man's land. And I wasn't really comfortable with that. I felt very yeah. unsettled. We ended our time in Atlanta and moved to Austin, Texas. And there was not an Anglo Catholic parish there. There was a lovely Episcopal church much lower but still fairly traditional in what they taught yeah. and I was part of a mom's group there this is where I met Emily Woodham uh, my yeah. dear dear friend uh-huh. I love her so much um, and she was just she was someone else that was very interested in talking about theological questions and so I'd go up to her house and sit and drink tea and just talk about how uh, we talked a lot about how to raise our kids with faith and mm-hmm. and all these sorts of things and um, we had so much in common, and I, I loved those conversations. I did not really love everything about the church that we were attending, and I, it was a really kind of a dark period for me. I got very dissatisfied. Mm. I would just be angry all the way to church and angry all the way home mm. because I didn't feel like this was it. Yeah. My husband was not really prepared to make a move. He was in, on his own journey, had his own kind of concerns and issues, and so we were sort of at an impasse. Mm. I did finally convince him to just go to one to go to RCIA. We mm-hmm. went to one session of RCIA and we showed up and what he and I had come to was so before we went to RCIA, this is what we're like. We looked up the liturgy of confirmation, yeah. the Catholic confirmation liturgy and read through it. Mm-hmm. And we saw that it said that we would be affirming that all that the Catholic Church teaches has been revealed by God. Yeah. And we were both like, hold on a second. Mm-hmm. What What is everything it teaches? And we felt like, I need to know. What is everything? What are all the things? 
Yeah. And we had asked a friend and he said, well, there are these de fide doctrines that you mm -hmm. have to believe. And we were like, okay, let me see the list. I need to know if I believe all of them before I can do this. Mm -hmm. And so we came to RCAA and we asked the sweet little small group leader, mm -hmm. where's the list of the de fide doctrines that I have to believe in mm -hmm. order to be Catholic? And she said, let me take you to the RCIA director. <laughs> they were not really sure what to do with us. And we told her, and she said, what doctrines are you concerned about? Is it like, let me guess, Immaculate Conception? And we're like, well, that might be one of them, but really, we, there's a list. Isn't there a list? And she was <laughs> like, can you come back and meet me in my office? Because uh -huh. I can't do this right now in yeah. the middle of RCIA. So we went and met with her. And she finally just said to us, you know, you know, you don't have to have it all perfect before you become Catholic. Mm -hmm. You don't have to figure it all out. You have to want to grow mm -hmm. toward what the church teaches, but you, you don't need, we don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. And we sort of walked out of there saying, no, we want to be really good Catholics. Mm -hmm. So we want to figure it out before we come in. Yeah. And we were really stuck there. Now, the other thing she told us was, you really should come in and talk to our priest. Mm -hmm. he, his name is Father Larry Covington. He's very Anglican friendly. He will help you. And we said, absolutely no, I'm not going to talk to a Catholic priest. I know what he's going to say. It's not going to help me. I don't want to hear it. So we just went back to our life. I was at that point teaching theology in an evangelical school yeah. where they didn't employ Catholics at all at the mm -hmm. time that I worked there. So I would not have, and also I was a theology teacher, Is so I would not PhD have been able to. Yes, yeah, I had okay. completed my PhD yeah. and adjuncted for a while and decided that I didn't really want an academic career and I took a job teaching high school. So I was teaching theology at a, this Christian high school and teaching, and it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. I feel like there were many parents who were very suspicious of me. I seemed a little different, mm -hmm. was maybe a little Catholic. Catholic mm -hmm. students would sort of close my classroom door and say, you're Catholic, right? No, <laughs> no I'm not. Promise, I'm absolutely, Stop I'm not. That. Like, don't <laughs> blow my cover. No, really, I absolutely am not. And they're like, yeah, but like the stuff you say, you know, and I was mm -hmm. very pro everyone being Catholic. I was like, you know, conf you thinking about your confirmation, you should do it. Mm -hmm. It's really important, you should. And they're like, thank you so much for supporting me. And Emily's like, I'm thinking of joining the Catholic homeschooling group. And I'm like, do it, it'd be great. I'm out here trying to promote this to everyone else, mm -hmm. and, and I was just very pro-Catholic. And the school had reformed roots, mm -hmm. so part of what I was tasked with was teaching Calvinist and non-Calvinist views right. with equal weight, which was very difficult for me yeah. uh, because some of the Calvinist ideas, I, uh, some I grew up with, some I did not, some mm -hmm. my grandfather rejected, and so I just didn't, I had a hard time with that. All of that's to say, it would have been really difficult for me to become Catholic at that point because sure. I would have had to leave my job. Mm -hmm. So we just tabled the discussion until I was leaving that position for other reasons. I had nothing to do with becoming Catholic. I was just ready to move on. And I took a job at a Baptist high school, but I was teaching English. Mm -hmm. And it was okay with them if I was Catholic. So it was on the table again. Yeah. This is right around the time my daughter's ready to be confirmed as an Episcopalian. Mm -hmm. The confirmation curriculum that they used was called Confirm, Not Conform. Okay. Both my husband and I had taught it as volunteers. Mm -hmm. They had a whole session on why it's good to be a heretic. I mean, it was just a whole sort of mess of things. We didn't really want her to be confirmed. Oh, okay. And so between my leaving the job and her age, we had the conversation again. And my husband just finally said, fine, let's do it. Mm. And I, I said, okay, I'm a little suspicious. <laughs> Are you sure? Like, is this what you... Yes, okay, yeah, let's go ahead. You figure out which parish. There were a couple that were more or less equal distance. I had a student that I thought was lovely, well-formed. I said, where do you go to church? She told me. I said, okay, I'm gonna email the pastor. I pull up that e email, I pull up that website to find it. It's Father Larry Covington. Mm. Same, same pastor, mm -hmm. he had moved parishes. I thought, okay, maybe we really are supposed to meet with this man, yeah. um, and we went and talked to him. We brought our kids with us. It was pouring down rain. We were late. It was a mess. We had all three kids. We came and sat on the couch in his office and he sort of was like, okay, what do you, what do you need? <laughs> and we started to talk to him about all of our misgivings or all of our worries about. And I brought up this uh, RCIA director who had said we didn't have to have it all figured out. And it was sort of testing the water. Like, yeah. is that true? Is the priest going to say something different? Was she just being wishy-washy? And mm -hmm. he was like, of course. 
Mm-hmm. Of course, there's no expectation of perfection. Mm-hmm. Catholicism is a, it's a lifelong journey. It's a journey toward God that's gonna continue mm-hmm. even after the point of your death. It's all about coming closer. And if you feel you can best do that in the context of the church, and I think that you can, because I think this is where the truth is. And so he was very open And he understood a lot of what it was to be Anglican. I think he really understood that in-between place that we were feeling. Mm -hmm. His part of his story is that at when he was first a pastor, he was next door to an Anglican church and that Anglican priest had kind of taken him under his wing Mm -hmm. a little bit as a young Catholic priest. So he had a couple of ex-Catholic priests who had become Catholic on his staff. And so he was very understood us, I guess. And we talked to him for about 45 minutes and he said, I don't really feel the need for you to go through RCIA. Can we just set a right. date? And we, it's sort of one of those moments where you're like, if I stop to think about this, this might not happen. So we just said yes. Mm-hmm. And we talked to him, I think in October maybe, and yep. we became Catholic December 3rd of that year. Wow. So everything went really quickly at the end. Wow. That's wonderful. Let's let's circle back around there. So in, you, you mentioned that your time sort of in the Anglo-Catholic community uh, that you'd worked out some of the some of the hangups, mm-hmm. okay, and then that that but even all the way up to the church, you know, there was this question of like, do we need to go all the way? What were some of those things that you worked through, and then some of those things that you were sure. holding on to? I think the things that I worked through were my discomfort with devotion to Mary. Okay, I came over to prayer to uh, for the dead mm-hmm. first, and then asking the intercession of saints. And Mary, I sort of, I had this attraction to the idea of Mary mm. because she was a, the quintessential example of what it meant to be a Christian. Right. And she was a woman. Mm-hmm. So going back to feeling like that door had been closed to me to study because I was a girl, I felt like I was always told to be Christ-like. Mm-hmm. But the only example I ever had was Jesus himself mm. and a lot of men in dark suits who ran my church. Yeah. And I, I used to say, I don't even know what it looks like to be Christ-like as a woman. Yeah. So I was attracted to the idea of Mary, but then I used to have my grandma in my head telling me that they were sure, going to kidnap sure, me. So yeah. I kind of had this, um, but being there and just doing it, yeah. just praying, just showing up at a rosary group and whatever it was, I realized that Mary is not revered as being her own light. She's mm-hmm. the moon that reflects the light yeah. of the sun. And I, I thought that makes so much sense. And that's so beautiful. So all of that, I was able to work through. That's beautiful, yeah. We came to believing in the presence of Christ in the Eucharist very easily. It was authority. That was the last mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Is the church really telling me that they have the keys of the kingdom? Are you serious? You right. have the keys of the kingdom. You get to decide like mm-hmm. who put you in, oh, Jesus put you in charge. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just that piece. And I remember I wrote it a letter to Father Warren <laughs> asking him, do you really believe all of this now? Mm-hmm. You really? And not probably in that kind of language, but that yeah. was the, the gist. And I also reached out to a friend who had become Catholic on social media and said, how did you decide that the church had all the answers? Mm-hmm. And Father Warren wrote me back a very impassioned defense of the immaculate conception that was extremely erudite and wonderful yeah. and I was like okay he really does believe it and my <laughs> friend what he wrote me back was so helpful because he didn't get into any details with me he said look when you're a Protestant you are responsible for determining what's true and what isn't it's on you yeah. and I got to the point where I was tired and I decided to let someone else tell me and that that really spoke to me mm-hmm. that was and that I feel like was that last step of saying, I believe that what the Catholic Church teaches has been declared by God, it's been proclaimed by God, that it's been revealed, mm-hmm. that part of the revelation is, is it's in scripture, but it's the interpretation of that scripture. It's, it's this big sort of beautiful picture and it all fits together. I'm ready to let someone else tell me and removing myself from the center of that um, and I think, you know, my husband and I have many conversations about that, and I think we're in a very similar place. So that was really the last thing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, the Pope, papal infallibility would be a way of putting it, but really it was the question of authority. Yeah. Yeah, that's always a big one, right? Because, I mean, some of these questions, on the one hand, there, there's like two parts. Of it. There has to be the openness to the possibility of the questions. And many times we can't even get that far, yeah. right, because there's just there's too much baggage, whatever. So we can be open to the questions. But still then the clincher is that I... I don't want to 
even though this makes sense to me now, I don't just want to go from, well, I agree with this church and now I agree with this church. And so I'm going where I agree with. Absolutely. And want something firmer. Absolutely. And I think that's what the sense in which it was a conversion. It was truly a change. And that was one of the things my husband said, because I started looking at one point, I was like, fine, you don't want to be Roman Catholic. Let's go to the Maronite church. I visited there for a while. Let's be Orthodox. Let's be check out the Melkites. Let's and he finally said to me, I don't want to be any special kind of Catholic. If we're going to be Catholic, I just want to be like a regular Catholic. Yeah. And I think that was important for us coming from Anglo-Catholicism, which was so niche, mm-hmm. to really open ourselves to the tradition more broadly mm-hmm. and not just say, I'm buying into this piece because I agree with it, right. but rather I'm accepting that this is the church that Jesus founded. Yeah, it's, it's moving to a different relationship with reality. That's interesting. Yeah, because sometimes absolutely. we look at the doctrines, but it's like, what's my relationship to truth? Yes, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the Eucharist. Sure. Again, you mentioned that that's one that you'd kind of work through, but I mean, that's obviously a real big change. The Eucharist and all the sacraments yeah. as, a, as a reality, as a, as, an, as a way of being a Christian. Talk yeah. about that a little bit more. I too. loved the idea of the Eucharist from when I read, well, I didn't understand when I read Thomas Akempis' devotion or Imitation of Christ, he ta- He goes from talking about having a relationship to Jesus to the importance of receiving the Eucharist. And mm-hmm. I just feel like that was a complete non sequitur. Mm-hmm. What does one have to do with the other? Because my experience of it was a little a little uh, way for things. They were like little chiclets. Yeah. And then you pass the, the plate and whatever. And I loved in the Episcopal Church that we all drank from one cup. Mm-hmm. I actually really loved that because I thought if we're saying this is about unity, then we all drink one cup and we all have one bread as opposed to everyone having their individual. So I liked the symbolism of it and I I thought it was pretty and it was nice. Mm -hmm. I really feel like being Anglo-Catholic, the physical gestures meant so much. Like we would do benediction of the Blessed Sacrament and everyone's kneeling and we're singing these very beautiful hymns, the um, Tantum Ergo and the Salutaris Hoste. It's just beautiful and it's, and singing the uh, humbly I adore thee, verity unseen. That hymn has the line in it, what the truth has spoken, that for truth I hold. So my senses don't perceive it, but it's true, it's there because he said it. Yeah. And that, I I just liked that idea. Mm-hmm. I think I wanted to believe that the world was, that there was more. Yeah. Because the faith I grew up with was just believe in Jesus and try and be a good person until mm-hmm. you die and go to heaven. Mm-hmm. And that felt so hollow, so shallow. I wanted there to be more to it. You know, I wanted the world to be charged with the grandeur of God. Yes. Like I really wanted yeah. there to be more. I wanted there to be something uh, beautiful underneath it. And so yeah. I think I was very, probably more primed to accept the reality of the Eucharist and that sacramental worldview mm-hmm. than than anything else um, that I came to in, in the Catholic faith. Yeah. I know you studied uh, the early church I did. fathers, and so yeah. that's that's something that's not even really a, an open question in the early church. No, yeah, yeah, they're very they're very much this is this is who we are, this is what we do, and that was another piece I hadn't really talked about. But as I was in my graduate studies and reading um, Augustine and, and Aquinas, I did two seminars on Aquinas, and I read a lot of um, even the Desert Fathers and Mothers and a lot of early Christian spirituality. There were just a lot of things about they took for granted. They just uh, assumed that you knew that that all of this was there, mm-hmm. and I, that really spoke to me because if you read that that material and then you look around you, mm-hmm. it, the uh, tradition I grew up in was so yeah. clearly a, a, a an offshoot and a sort of pale mm-hmm. one over here um, in terms of making a connection and continuity. So, and that all of that material, I approached it very openly. I read it and I thought, okay, these guys know what they're talking about. Their answers are, so it was a little bit like the purgatory answer, I thought. That answer was so deep and so smart and yet so simple. It fits with the Bible, but it also, it it fits, again, my humanity. It fits the world. Yeah, yeah, it it just made sense. And I thought that it was, um, made the Bible make more sense. Yeah, I was talking to Dr. Francis Beckwith recently uh, interview and he, he he points out that the things that we disagree on as Christians nowadays were the things like the Eucharist in the early church that they weren't even an open question. Right. Like they were just all assumed for the right. first hundreds and hundreds of years in the church. Whereas the things that we agree on nowadays were precisely the things yeah. that 
that they battled over tooth and claw in the early church, right. and the church had to come in and and make authoritatively. a decision and say this is what it this is what it is. Right. Yeah, we've sorted through all of this. I think actually that was an important piece of reading the early church and figuring out the creed because mm-hmm. I had been taught that the church was hijacked by Constantine in 325 and that the true church went underground somewhere and didn't reappear until the Protestant Reformation. Um, But, you know, recognizing the creed, that the creed was not sort of imposed upon, it was a summary of scripture, it was a summary of revelation, it was a summary of what we knew to be the case. And it was coming from, here's what we've, we've, we've got, here's what was handed down to us and not something that was sort of externally imposed and yet was very authoritative. It was the church stepping in and saying, we need to stop having this conversation. This needs to be settled. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, again, you guys were kind of stuck thinking that the truth must be somewhere in there between Catholicism and Orthodoxy. Talk a little bit bit more about Orthodoxy. Why, how'd that get off the table? That's a great question. Um, Orthodoxy, (laughs) I loved the Orthodox church that we went to in Atlanta. Um, It was dedicated to St. John Maximovich of of Shanghai in San Francisco. I've Mm -hmm. been to San Francisco. I venerated his body there. And Mm -hmm. I just, I love, I used to wear a a medal that the priest there gave to me. Um, So I had this connection with him. But Orthodoxy felt, it also felt very niche. Mm -hmm. And in a way, we liked that when we were Anglican. But it felt like, I go to this particular church. It was very similar to my upbringing. If I move to another city, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could replicate that. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, I know that it is a a large church, but because of its polity and the way it's organized, it just felt more like they were islands. Mm -hmm. And my brother-in-law is Orthodox and Mm -hmm. he became Orthodox at a certain point. And so that, you know, caused us to kind of think it through. But there was also this sense that we had that they didn't regard everyone who was not Orthodox. Not every Orthodox person regarded non-Orthodox people as Christians. I know mm. that some do. Mm. I don't want to be unfair, but yeah. there was a kind of a messiness about it, I guess, or it just didn't feel unified. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, it was just a question of, you know, which parish I show up at, what answer I'm going to get. And that felt more like more of the same. Sure. Uh, Which I feel like I'm being yeah. overly hor- harsh on the Orthodox. No, I'm not no, trying to be, but that no. was really our experience of it was such yeah. that we just thought this isn't really going to answer what we're looking for. Yeah, well, I can certainly say for myself, I, I've met many Orthodox men and women, and they, you know, they're, I applaud their faith. Oftentimes we're finding, we find in Orthodox Christians uh, uh, holding on to the tradition and the spirituality, the ancient faith Absolutely. in ways that many modern Catholics don't. So I mean, there's Absolutely. no question about that. But it's interesting, you know, in the, this the lingering question of authority and, and of unity, that we're, we're yearning for unity, but it's like, what what does that unity consist in? What mm-hmm. kind of unity? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean a, a pure, unmessy church. Yes. Right? Like sometimes we leave churches where there's splits and there's scandals. Right. It's not that we're <laughs> moving to a, we're looking for a <laughs> unity where it's, it's just, it's more like a marriage. Yes. It's the way I like to think of it. Absolutely. You know? I, I agree with that. I think... Um, if we'd had a, di- a different exposure to orthodoxy or different experience, mm-hmm. I guess that it could have been uh, the theologically so much was in that. And the liturgy is very beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, and my brother and sister-in-law have a beautiful, vibrant faith. And, yes. and mm-hmm. so there are many things there that are very appealing. But yeah, it, it is, it is. can I adopt this and can I continue to live with and grow with this relationship, Yeah, which is like a marriage for the rest right. of my life. And yeah, we felt like the Catholic Church was the place yeah, we, we still have theological battles in the church. We still have scandals and obviously, you know, um, sinners. I mean, yeah, here, absolutely. But, but we, there's something about the, the, the unity, uh, the authority uh, through the magisterium that it's a unity worth fighting for even when the marriage is bad, right? Yeah. Like we don't break up the family. We, we hold together. And so um, it's within that permanence of the church that it takes a while but we work through things, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. the, the Holy Spirit, you know, in, in the mystery of things, maintains a unity amidst our messiness and our sinfulness. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And that has always really spoken to me across the history of the church because yeah. there, some of the things that have gone on, you would think that this would not continue. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yet it does. It's perf- it's persevered in spite yeah. of people's failings and all of the mistakes. And um, that's one thing I, I know with my Protestant friends, they'll sort of mention something, some scandal in the church yeah. and then say, oh, we're sorry. Well, no, we know. 
We yeah. know. We're, yeah. we're not surprised by that. We are aware of all of those things, and it's just as part of the human piece. But yeah. the, the unity, I mean, it continues. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about, yeah, at, at, a, at that one point in your story, you're talking about how yeah, your, your early exposure to Catholicism mm -hmm. were through picking up not books on apologetics or church history, but picking up books of, of Catholic spirituality. Yes. Talk a, a bit more about those, but about how you're, you know, you're sent, again, you, you were brought up, um, you know, impacted by your grandfather and sort of a Baptist, you know, basic Bible Christianity. How did your sense of what the spiritual life consists of change? You know, sure. What does it mean to be in relationship with God? What does that look like? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think with, in my early life, the only thing that I knew was going to church and reading the Bible and having your your Bible quiet time. And it was mm. sort of, that was it. And, and I did that. There wasn't a great space for prayer mm. or anything contemplative. I was, I've always been a very intellectual person. I was very intellectual as a child. But I also think I had a great desire for, uh, for silence mm -hmm. and for contemplation that I didn't, I didn't have any place to go with that. Um, if I were growing up now, I could see myself getting into yoga or meditation or something like that, but I, and I just didn't know anything about those things. I picked up St. John of the Cross in part, I liked the cover. <laughs> it's very sophisticated. Hey, beauty. It was a really nice cover. You know? um, I also had, I had a CD that had a setting of one of his poems. Mm. And I thought, well, he sounds interesting and I love poetry. So yeah. I picked up that book and it gave me a sense of space for, for that quietness of prayer. A lot of the time when I went to church, I just felt really overwhelmed by mm. sound. It was like a big rock band and it was a really energetic speaker. And I just remember feeling, and in college as well, overwhelmed. Like it was this wall of sound coming at me. I remember telling a friend when I was in college that I was attending a service that didn't have any music. Yeah. And she was absolutely flummoxed. What do you mean? What do yeah. you do? I said, we pray. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, what I added on to it, so I still was very invested in the Bible and I mm -hmm. still can still go to church and I still, I do like singing, um, but I think um, really understanding what prayer is yeah. and that prayer isn't a moment to ask God for the things that you want, that prayer is about connection, prayer is about communing with the divine and connecting with something beyond yourself. I think that's really what I wanted. Yeah. And so those books, as little as I understood them at the time, because I'm sure I didn't really grasp what was happening. Um, I also really appreciated in St. John of the Cross that there was a place in the spiritual life for a dark moment mm -hmm. because I felt a lot of pressure for everything to be positive right. and for everything to be good and everything to be moving in the right direction at all times. And if it wasn't, it was probably because you had some sin or something was going on or you mm -hmm. weren't doing something right. Um, it's a lot of pressure. And so to recognize that there are seasons in your life that are dry where you don't feel God's presence and that that's perfectly normal yeah. was also, you know, something I took on board and took seriously. Yeah, the, the doctrinal stuff, I mean, of justification and grace and faith and works and all that kind of stuff can seem sometimes like minutiae to people outside having to wrestle through those. But they're important because they boil down to trying to find the place where I, I, I set myself in the presence of God and I figure out how to relate to Him. And you know, it's so important because, again, our spiritual life is not so much about what we do. It's not like I have to do a bunch of stuff, but there, but a lot happens. Like it's transformational. I mean, that's another way yeah, to think about yeah, it. Yeah, so that's something yes. yeah, yeah. Yes, and that's something that I don't, I didn't grow up with. Mm -hmm. I, I would say I remember in arguments with my family, your spiritual life should change you. You are right. different from the day you got saved, right. you know, you, it should change you. And their response to that was no, mm. no, you're still just the same old sinner that you were. Yeah. And it's not that I would say now that you're not still a sinner. Of course we all, mm -hmm. we all are, but it does, it transforms you and yeah. you grow and you change and you're different. Mm -hmm. You have made an, progress in holiness. This is a Methodist language that I would have learned yeah. when I was there doing my theology degree that we can make and do make progress in holiness mm -hmm. by practicing virtues. Yeah. That is, is a very revolutionary idea for my childhood, but is something that I think is, it's just demonstrably, demonstrably true. We can all look at someone we know who's been in the spiritual life longer or who just clearly has attained some virtues that I don't have. Yeah. And you can see that and, and that's, you know, to not have any way to explain that 
uh, doesn't make sense to me. So yeah. I think it's really it was really helpful to say, no, actually it does. And that's really a relief yeah. that I, I get to, mm-hmm. you know, continue becoming a new person. Right. Yeah. We just keep applying ourselves to that grace. Absolutely. And that's what we need the church and the sacraments. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Annie, we've run out of time, but I think we could talk for another couple hours <laughs> on this. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home program. I hope that I know that I I know that Annie's story uh, is an inspiration to so many out there. Uh, thank you for watching along with it. Again, if, if you are on a journey, and we're all on a journey, but if you're thinking about becoming Catholic, if you have questions, uh, if you're maybe open to the Catholic Church in a way that you weren't before, and you'd like to walk around with, walk along with other people who get that, uh, check us out at chnetwork.org. We'd love to walk that journey with you. Uh, in the meantime, we'll be back again next week here on the Journey Home program. God bless you. See you soon.